Science and Human Origins, Francis Collins, Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion. We've been talking about science and human origins um, for the last uh, three weeks and now this week. We have one more time and then uh, we'll get into uh, some of the objections that have been raised to the concepts that have been put in the book. We've been through uh, the chapter which is titled the same as the book, Science and Human Origins, uh, Darwin's Little Engine That Couldn't, Human Origins in the Fossil Record. This time, uh, Casey Luskin has written Francis Collins' Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion. And um, next week we'll talk about the science of Adam and Eve. For those who don't know, Casey Luskin is the research coordinator at the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. He holds graduate degrees in both science and law. He earned his BS and MS in Earth Sciences from the University of California, San Diego. His law degrees from the University of San Diego. He formerly conducted geologic research at the Scripps Institution for Oceanography and has published in both science and law journals, has been interviewed in numerous places. Uh, Casey starts out his uh, discussion with the paragraph, leading proponents of theistic evolution like Francis Collins offer two primary genetic arguments for whom an ape common ancestry, junk DNA and chromosomal fusion. The arguments from junk DNA fails because most non-coding DNA has important cellular functions and is not junk. The argument from chromosomal fusion fails because at most it indicates that humans experienced a fusion event, but says nothing about whether our lineage leads back to a common ancestor with apes. Again, this is going to be the Reader's Digest region, uh, version. If you see ellipses, that means I've omitted material. Those of you who want to know what the material is that was omitted can read the book. And it is available online for free. Uh, if you want to, um, that's in the resources uh, uh, section of the uh, email that I send out. If you don't get the email, feel free to um, email uh, faithsciencess at gmail.com and we'll put you on the list. In his best-selling book, The Language of God, 2006. Geneticist Francis Collins claims that human DNA provides powerful support for Darwin's theory of evolution. That is, descent from a common ancestor with natural selection operating on randomly occurring variations. More specifically, he argues that our DNA demonstrates that humans and apes share a common ancestor. And the reference, of course, is a well-known book by Francis Collins, The Language of God. Formerly the head of the Human Genome Project, Collins is well known as an evangelical Christian who embraces both Darwin, Darwinian evolution and embryonic cell research, stem cell research. And uh, he has some references for that. With the help of a two million grant from the John Templeton Foundation in 2008, Collins co-founded the Biologos F uh, Foundation with the purpose of persuading Christian leaders and lay people to accept biological evolution. And uh, there's some material on that. Collins had to step down from the group after being appointed director of the National Institutes of Health by President Barack Obama. But his emphatic defense of ape human common ancestry still has wide influence in the faith community. And of course, the Biologos Foundation that he founded continues on without him. Collins offers two main DNA-based arguments for his claim that humans share a common ancestor with apes and other animals. First, non-coding DNA shared by humans and other mammals is supposedly functionless, functionless junk, which according to Collins means the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. Second, human chromosome number two resulted from fusion of two chromosomes like those found in apes evidence which Collins claims is very difficult to understand 
without postulating a common ancestor between humans and apes. And uh, references, of course, are to the language of God. These are common evolutionary arguments for ape-human common ancestry, but as this chapter will show, Collins' case is largely based on outdated science and questionable assumptions, at least according to, Dr. Er, to Mr. Luskin. To be specific, numerous studies have found extensive evidence of function for non-coding DNA, showing that it is not genetic junk after all. Number two, human chromosomal fusion may imply that the human lineage experienced a fusion event, but this tells us nothing about whether our lineage extends back to share a common ancestor with apes. Moreover, the genetic evidence for human chromosomal fusion isn't nearly as strong as Collins and others make it out to be. What exactly, what, what exactly is chromosomal fusion uh, in, in a box? In well, a maybe box I should box. explain it real briefly. Um, chimpanzees and gorillas have 48 chromosomes, 24 pair. The human genome has 46. And if you look at the chromosomes, they fairly well match in terms of the kinds of materials that are on them. There are some differences. There are some things that are turned around and a few things like that. But by and large, the chromosomes have the same enzymes on the same chromosomes, except for two chromosomes. And they appear to match parts of chromosome two. And it looks like they could have uh, been swapped into each other, joined together, and then gotten a chromosome two out of it. And uh, the argument is actually the tail end of another argument. Well, humans and chimps have different chromosome numbers, so how, how did humans uh, evolve from chimps or some chimp-like ancestor? And uh, uh, the argument sounded like a good one until they found out that chromosome two, in fact, matched these other two chromosomes, and it looked like they had been kind of stuck together, um, at least if you look at certain things. And we'll get into how much evidence there is for that. Um, but that's what they're talking about by chromosomal fusion. So it's kind of like putting a truck and a car together? Uh, yeah, if you want to say hitching the car to the truck. Okay. Did that answer enough of the question? Yeah, yeah. It okay. Pointed me the direction. Go ahead. Uh, 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 we want to catch this for posterity. Uh, so. okay. uh, Chromosome fusion is trying to get two things that are trying to age up each other to be together but are not subjected to each other at all. And there's a, there's a sequential issue that God created to be uh, mandated under the authority. In any case, um, so what they're saying is it's not quite as clear that chromosome is, is used as it's commonly called, but even if it were, it would be something that happens um, uh, that could have happened regardless of whether humans or apes shared the same number of chromosomes. Uh, that's to use his two arguments in reverse order. In sum, According to Luskin, the evidence from DNA does not establish Collins' conclusion about human evolution. Non-coding DNA, he's going to tackle this one first, and he's going to say it's not really junk after all. To his credit, and this is an important point, because it outlines what the real argument is about. Collins is a, a, a smart guy, and he avoids the usual simplistic argument that shared functional genetic similarity between two species must demonstrate they shared a common ancestor. Acknowledging 
that functional genetic similarity alone does not, of course, prove a common ancestor because a designer could have used successful design principles over and over again. Instead, Collins offers a different argument. He cites a type of DNA called ancient repetitive elements. Um, that is to say, elements that have the same series and then it repeats and it repeats and it repeats in the DNA. As allegedly non-functional junk DNA, which in his view demonstrates both Darwinian evolution and human ape common ancestry. Maybe I should clarify that argument just a little bit. The argument basically goes, okay, it makes sense if humans need, let's say, glucose 6-phosphate uh, uh, phosphate uh, uh, dehydrogenase for some particular purpose, G6PD. Uh, and uh, in fact, G6PD deficiency is a known problem in humans. Um, chimpanzees probably need the same enzyme. <laughs> and so it makes sense for God to use the same enzyme in both creatures. What doesn't quite make sense is why God would pick stuff that doesn't really function at all and make humans and chimpanzees similar. But that, of course, assumes that we know that whatever it is doesn't have any function at all. Uh, it's sort of like it makes sense for if you're writing a book and then you're writing another book that you copy passages from one into the other one if they happen to say, uh, give the same function. Maybe tweak a word here or there. What, uh, what makes it more likely that an unthinking person is doing this is if you see errors in the, uh, in the uh, you know, perhaps misspelled words or words uh, reversed in place move from one to the other, then you start thinking, no, this is copying, this is not redesigning with a, uh, uh, from scratch. That's, that's the essential argument. Repetitive elements are common in mammalian genomes. We have them, apes have them, mice have them, and we often share them in the same places in our genomes. In Collins' view, unless one is willing to take the position that God has placed these decapitated AREs, uh, repetitive elements, in these precise positions to confuse and mislead us, the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. Atheist Richard Dawkins, of course, makes a similar argument, uh, which I've omitted the reference for, but it's in the book. Both Collins and Doctors are making a theological argument. Basically, God wouldn't do it that way, as much as a scientific claim. I will leave the soundness of their theology to others, but their science has been overturned by the evidence. Open-minded scientists understood this long before Collins wrote his book. In 2002, biologist Richard Sternberg surveyed the literature and found extensive evidence for functions for uh, repetitive elements, and he found some of the functions that include, and there's the, where he put them in, you'll notice that this is a good peer-reviewed uh, article. Um, satellite repeats forming higher order nuclear structures. Satellite repeats forming centromeres. Uh, something that's needed to attach the DNA to uh, uh, spindles so that you can separate the DNA when the time comes. Satellite repeats and other uh, repetitive elements involved in chromatin condensation to, to get the uh, DNA to form the chromosomes that we see instead of being strung out uh, in linear fashion. Telomeric tandem repeats in line elements uh, Telomeres are necessary to keep the, uh, to be expendable one, uh, uh, one telomere at a time and, uh, and allow the, uh, allow the repeating of cell division multiple times. Otherwise, the first time you did a cell division, uh, or perhaps the second time if you 
had one telomere. Uh, uh, the cell would die. We need a lot more than one or two cell divisions. I have a comment about that. The cell divisions, sometimes they can be separated. Um, cell divisions, sometimes they can be separated because there's no conjunction of the, of the matter. Yeah. OK. Um, Subtelomeric nuclear positioning for chromatin boundary elements. Uh, Non-TE interspersed chromatin boundary elements. Uh, short interspersed nuclear elements, or as they're called, signs, as nucleation centers for methylation, which is important to uh, deactivate uh, DNA that's not needed. Let's say you have a liver cell and it has kidney cell functions programmed into it, you want to deactivate those. Signs as chromatin boundary insulator elements. Signs involved in cell proliferation. Signs involved in cellular stress response. Signs involved in translation, which may be connected to stress response. Signs involved in building cohesion to chromosomal lines or long interspersed uh, nuclear elements involved in DNA repair. And there's, of course, a reference. Uh, Sternberg concluded that the selfish or junk DNA narrative and allied frameworks must join the other icons of neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory that despite their variance with empirical evidence nevertheless persist in the literature. Uh, that allusion to icons of evolution is probably deliberate. Uh, Sternberg is friendly, although not su directly supportive of intelligent design. And I suspect he's gotten more friendly as people have tried to push him away. Uh, other genetic research has continued to uncover function for various types of repetitive DNA, including signs, lines, and ALU elements. One paper even suggested that repetitive ALU sequences might be involved in the development of higher brain function in humans. And there's a whole bunch of references to that. And there's so many of them that uh, there's not a good way of putting them with the rest of it. You can see it's a whole page. And if you think that that's bad, you should see the next bunch. Numerous other functions have been discovered for various types of non-coding DNA, including repairing DNA, assisting DNA replication, regulating DNA transcription, aiding in folding and maintenance of chromosomes, controlling RNA editing and splicing, and helping to fight disease. And now watch uh, uh, regulating embryological development. And watch the uh, note 16 takes a whole page all by itself. Uh, about five references there. 17 is relatively short. Um, 18 um, has multiple references. Actually, 18 continues. Um, 19 has multiple references. 20 has multiple references. And 21 and 22 also have multiple references. Book is a rich gold mine if you want to study into this area. Sternberg, along with the University of Chicago geneticist James Shapiro, um, predicted in 2005 that one day we will think of what used to be junk DNA as a critical component of truly expert cellular control regimes. That day, foreseen by Sternberg and Shapiro may have come sooner than they expected. In 2007, the Washington Post reported that a huge scientific consortium, the ENCODE project, discovered that the vast majority of the three billion letters of the human genetic code are busy toiling away at an array of previously invisible tasks. And there's the references for those two. According to an article in Nature reporting on the project, Biology's new glimpse at a universe of non-coding DNA, what used to be called junk DNA, has been fascinating and befuddling. Researchers from an international collaborative project called the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE, showed that in 
a selected portion of the genome containing just a few percent of the protein coding sequence, between 74 percent and 93 percent of DNA, was transcribed into RNA. Much non-coding DNA has a regulatory role. Small RNAs of different varieties seem to control the gene expression at the level of both DNA and RNA transcripts in ways that are, only, are still only beginning to come cl become clear. And uh, the reference for that, we'll skip over a little bit more. Uh, Philip Kaparov, Kaparnov et al. in Nature Reviews Genetics said, evidence indicates that most of both strands of the human genome might be transcribed, implying extensive overlap of transcriptional units with regulatory and regulatory elements. These observations suggest that genomic architecture is not collinear, but is instead interleaved and modular, and that the same genomic sequences are multifunctional, that is, used for multiple independently regulated transcripts and as regulatory regions. Maybe we should just leave that mic up there. Uh, no, that's okay. uh, I don't know that I can answer that question at this point. Um, we're still just beginning to understand what some of these things are doing. Again, uh, quoting um, Paulo Amaral uh, et al and this is in science, the past few years have revealed that the genomes of all studied eukaryotes are almost entirely transcribed, generating an enormous number of non-protein coding RNAs. In parallel, it is increasingly evident that many of these RNAs have regulatory function. Here we highlight recent advances that illustrate the diversity of uh, non-coding RNA uh, control of ge genome dynamics, cell biology, and developmental programming. So there are all kinds of things that are going on. A 2003 article in Science acknowledged that junk DNA labels, similar to those used by Collins, have discouraged scientists from discovering the functions of non-coding repetitive elements. Uh, he doesn't make a big point of it, but this is one case where it appears that at least the rabid anti-creationist stand has actually uh, decreased our ability to do proper science. Although catchy, the term junk DNA for many years repelled mainstream researchers from studying non-coding DNA. Who except for a small number of genomic clotchards would like to dig through genomic garbage? However, in science as in normal life, there are some clotchards who, at the risk of being ridiculed, explore unpopular territories. Because of them, the view of junk DNA, especially repetitive elements, began to change in the early 1990s. Now more and more biologists regard repetitive elements as a genomic treasure. In addition to repetitive elements, another kind of junk DNA ap appealed to by Collins to support ape-human common ancestry is the pseudogene. Collins writes in The Language of God that a pseudogene in humans caspase-12, is functionless, and asks, why would God have gone to the trouble of inserting such a non-functional gene in this precise location? He makes the same kind of argument in his later book, The Language of Science and Faith, 2011, citing a supposedly functionless vitamin C pseudogene in humans. To claim that human genome was created by God independently rather than having descended from a common ancestor means God inserted a broken piece of DNA into our genomes. This is not remotely plausible. Similarly, Brown University biologist Kenneth Miller has cited such genes as a case-closed evidence because common ancestry is the only explanation for so many matching errors in the same gene. And uh, there are the references. One of them has to do with Casey Luskin personally talking to Dr. Miller. But are pseudogenes really only functionless broken DNA? As with AREs, multiple functions for pseudogenes have been discovered. And uh, there's some of the references. In fact, two leading biologists writing an annual review of genetics reported that pseudogenes that have been suitably investigated often exhibited functional traits 
functional roles, excuse me. Likewise, a 2011 paper in the journal RNA entitled Pseudogenes, Pseudofunctional or Key Regulators in Health and Disease, argues that they should no longer be presumed junk. Pseudogenes have long been labeled as junk DNA, failed copies of genes that arise during the evolution of genomes. However, recent results are challenging this moniker. Indeed, some pseudogenes appear to harbor the potential to regulate their protein co coding cousins. And the references again. Indeed, one study suggests that even the caspase 12 pseudogene which Collins cites can produce a card only protein, a type of functional protein in humans. The study suggests that human caspase 12 interacts with some biological pathways and encourages science, scientists to study the caspase 12 pseudogene to understand its function. Since human pseudogene, pseudo caspase 12 is structurally comparable to iceberg and cop pseudo ice, which are card only proteins. It would, only, it would be interesting to study its involvement in similar pathways. And again, we're going to have some rather massive notes, so I'll just go ahead and put them in. While there is much we still don't know about non-coding DNA, Collins was wrong to simply assume that the vast majority of repetitive DNA is functionless genetic flotsam and jetsam, or that pseudogenes are broken DNA. A genomic revolution in the past five to ten years has uncovered numerous functions for non-coding DNA elements. Ironically, Collins himself participated in some of this research as head of the Human Genome Project. Perhaps that is why the year following the language of God, Collins started to pull back in his public promotion of the idea of junk DNA, even telling one reporter that he had stopped using the term. And uh, you'll notice that reference there. Uh, chromosomal, we're going to move on to his second, uh, the second argument he's going to deal with, chromosomal fusion without common ancestry. The second main argument for the human ape common ancestry made by Francis Collins is his claim that human chromosome 2 has a structure similar to what one would expect if two chimpanzee chromosomes became fused end to end. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but chimps and other great apes have 24. In the language of God, Collins argues that this chromosomal fusion explains why humans have one less pair of chromosomes than apes, claiming it is very difficult to understand this observation without postulating a common ancestor. To the contrary, it is very easy to understand this evidence without postulating a common ancestor. Assuming that human chromosome 2 is fused, as Collins claims it is, human chromosomal fusion merely shows that at some point within our lineage, two chromosomes became fused. Logically speaking, this evidence tells us nothing about whether our human lineage leads back to a common ancestor with apes, nor does it tell us whether the earliest humans were somehow ape-like. Even if our ancestors did once have 24 pair of chromosomes, they still could have been essentially just like modern, fully modern humans. As University of North Carolina Charlotte anthropologist Jonathan Marks observed, the fusion isn't what gives us language or bipedalism or big brain or art or sugarless bubble gum. It's just one of those neutral changes, lacking outward expression and neither good nor bad. And this, by the way, is from somebody who is not particularly sympathetic to intelligent design. If we step outside of the Darwinian box, the following scenario becomes equally possible with common ancestry. The human lineage was designed separately from apes. A chromosomal fusion occurred during our lineage somewhere. The trait spread throughout the human population during a genetic bottleneck when the human population size suddenly became quite small. In such a scenario, the evidence would appear precisely as we find it without any common ancestry in apes as explained by the two models described in figure 4.1, and we're going to see that, the two models. You see, you could have a common ancestry with 48 to begin with and 48 modern chimps uh, and some kind of chromosomal fusion event, but you could have started out with humans that were different from apes, just simply having 48 chromosomes, and you had a fusion event that spread throughout the entire human population. Assuming that they're correct about 
that there is strong evidence that there was a fusion event. Um, by itself, it doesn't tell us um, much about um, whether humans or apes uh, had similar chromosomes or not. Now, I will have to say that I think that it is very weak evidence for human ape common ancestors simply because the inverse is not true, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but I do think that it's, it's certainly not uh, knockdown evidence. A model A is, is the standard evolutionary model. However, model B is equally compatible with the observed data. To further illustrate why chromosomal fusion does not demonstrate common ancestry between humans and apes, consider the following hypothetical situation. Imagine that the year 2050, a small isolated human tribe experiences a second chromosomal fusion event. They remain fertile and otherwise normal. We'll call them the double fuser people. In 2100, uh, war, sickness, and famine destroy the rest of humanity, but the double fusers survive and repopulate the earth, rediscovering genetics and evolution. Eventually, the double fusers develop technology to examine their own chromosomes, and the scientists exclaim, oh, we double fusers have 22 pairs of chromosomes, including two pairs of, fu two of fu fused chromosomes. Since apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes, we must have been developed from uh, descended from ape-like creatures with 48 chromosomes. Well, you could make the argument for the one, uh, maybe a little bit, but certainly not. It's not a knockdown argument for the other. From our advantage, we see that, from our vantage, we see that the double fuser second chromosomal fusion event took place recently, far removed from any common ancestor between humans and chimps, and offers little logical reason to infer human-chimp common ancestry. Why should we assume the case must be any different with our one fused chromosome? Yet many Darwinian evolutionists uh, mistakenly view our one pair of fused chromosomes precisely as the double fusers view their two pairs of fused chromosomes. The Darwinian might respond by saying, well, the fusion event uh, evidence shows that our ancestors once had 48 chromosomes like chimpanzees and other great apes do today. Moreover, our fused chromosome number two even contains segments resembling eight chromosomes 2A and 2B. And that's how they're now numbered, by the way. Common ancestry would have predicted all this evidence. But the Darwinian rejoinder merely restates the fact that humans and apes share a highly similar genetic structure. This high level of human chimp functional genetic similarity does not demonstrate common ancestry. In chapter one, and Gauger has already elaborated why shared human-chimp functional genetic similarity does not necessarily demonstrate common ancestry. Functional genetic similarities might result from functional requirements and common design rather than inheritance from a common ancestor. Indeed, as we have seen, even Francis Collins admits that functional genetic similarity alone does not, of course, prove a common ancestor because a designer could have used successful design principles over and over again. Thus far, we have assumed that there really was a fusion event in human genetic history, but how strong is the actual evidence for this conclusion, for this contention? Telomeric DNA at the ends of our chromosomes normally consists of thousands of repeat of the six ba base pair sequence TTAGGG. But the alleged fusion point in human chromosome 2 contains far less telomeric DNA than it should if two chromosomes were fused end to end. Small, fewer copies. As evolutionary biologist Daniel Fairbanks admits, the location has only 158 repeats and, quote, only 44 are perfect copies of the sequence. Additionally, a paper in genome research found that the alleged tel telomeric sequences we do have are degenerated significantly and highly diverged from the prototypic telomeric repeats. The paper is surprised at this finding because the fusion event supposedly happened recently, much too recent for such dramatic divergence of sequence. Thus, the paper asked, if the fusion occurred within the telomeric repeat arrays less than about six million years ago, why are the arrays at the fusion site so degenerate? 
The conclusion is this, if two chromosomes were fused end-to-end -end in humans, then a huge amount of alleged telomeric DNA is missing or garbled. I think you could fairly say, given the evidence, missing and s some missing and some garbled. Finally, the presence of telomeric DNA within a mammalian chromosome isn't highly unusual and does not necessarily indicate some ancient point of fusion of two chromosomes. Evolutionary biologist Richard Sternberg points out that interstitial telomeric sequences are commonly found through mammalian genomes, but the telomeric sequence with, sequences with in human chromosome 2 are cherry-picked by evolutionists and cited as evidence for a fusion event. And this is a particularly interesting, um, uh, if you have the chance to visit the, uh, uh, the website and take a look at the uh, citation I put in where it is and the, the reference. Of all the known ITs, uh, IT sequences, that's telomeric sequences, there are many in the genomes of chimps and humans, as well as mice and rats and cows. The 2Q13, that's on chromosome 2, uh, the big arm, uh, uh, the thir number 13 um, band, ITS, is the only one that can be associated with an evolutionary breakpoint or fusion. The other ITSs, I hasten to add, do not square up with chromosomal breakpoints in primates. And he gives a reference there. In brief, to hone in on the 2Q13 ITS as being typical of what we see in human and chimp genomes seems almost like cherry picking data. Most are not DNA scars in the way they have been portrayed. In other words, this, this stuff is all throughout chromosomes. And the, it just happens that one happens to be in, in the right uh, place. But for all we know, that was a design instead. Thus, there are at least three reasons why the evidence isn't exactly what the fusion story predicts. Number one, the alleged fusion point in chromosome two contains much less telomeric DNA than it should. Number two, which I think is more telling, the supposed telomeric sequences we do have are highly degenerate and highly diverged from what we would expect if there was a relatively recent fusion event. And number three, finding interstitial telomeric DNA in mammals isn't all that remarkable and doesn't necessarily indicate a, a fusion event. But, and this is the key point, even if human chromosome two is the result of two other chromosomes which became fused, this is not evidence for human ape common ancestry. At most it shows our human lineage experienced a chromosomal fusion event, but does not tell us whether our lineage leads back to a common ancestor with apes. And his conclusions. In recent years, genetic arguments have been offered to the public as definitive new proof that human beings shared a common ancestor with apes and other animals. Francis Collins has been at the forefront of po popularizing such arguments, especially in the faith community. According to Collins, there's no longer any room for disagreement. The study of genomes leads inex inexorably to the conclusion that we humans share a common ancestor with other living things. Indeed, not only is the idea of human ape common ancestry beyond dispute, but the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. And that's, of course, Collins, the language of God. Yet, for all Collins' use of terms like inexorably and inescapable, the fact remains that the evidence he presented, presents based on genetics simply does not show what he claims. At best, the evidence discussed in this chapter reaffirms something we already knew, that humans and chimps show, share similar functional genetic sequences. But this can be explained by common design just as well as by common descent. What else is left? Not much. As we have seen, Collins' arguments from junk DNA are being eroded with each passing month by new studies uncovering a myriad of functions for non-coding DNA. In particular, biologists are finding extensive evidence of function for non-coding elements, like ancient repetitive DNA and even pseudogenes. 
The precise types of DNA, which Francis Collins and others claim are non-functional genetic flotsam and jetsam that demonstrate human ape common ancestry. And he refers you to the uh, Jonathan Wells book, the, the Myth of Junk DNA. Collins' argument for chromosomal fusion is also, also fails to deliver. Even if a chromosomal fusion event occurred, it would tell us nothing about whether our lineage leads back to a common ancestor with apes. Of course, it isn't even completely clear that a chromosomal fusion has occurred. Interstitial telomeric DNA doesn't necessarily indicate a fusion event, and the interstitial telomeric sequences in human chromosome 2 are highly diverged from what we would expect from a recent fusion event. As a supporter of the idea that many aspects of nature are best explained by intelligent design rather than unguided processes, I want to note that intelligent design is not incompatible in principle with human sharing ancestry with other species, and particularly he's talking about humans and chimpanzees. At its core, intelligent design challenges not common ancestry, but the claim that life's complexity arose via unguided processes like random mutation and natural selection. Thus, a guided form of common ancestry would be compatible with intelligent design. Nevertheless, unlike proponents of Darwinian evolution, intelligent design theorists are not obligated to accept human-ape common ancestry as a given. They are free to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And where the evidence leads is not to the conclusions promoted by Francis Collins. As we have seen, genetic arguments for human-ape common ancestry are based more upon Darwinian assumptions and outdated data than careful deductions from the evidence. Now, as I read the chapter, this is me, of course, not uh, uh, Casey Luskin. It seemed to argue that the idea that chimpanzees and humans share nonsense sequences or junk DNA and therefore must be related is shaky, primarily because it isn't really junk. And he's arguing that the idea that uh, chromosome 2 is a fused common ancestor chromosome is shaky, and even if it were solid, would not provide a common ancestor with chimpanzees. I think Casey Luskin does make a good argument. I, I think it's fair to say that he doesn't have an obvious theological motive for separating humans and apes. Uh, he has an obvious uh, uh, scientific motive for considering the possibility, and that's perhaps more than some other people will do. The detail given, I think, is astounding and it's very useful if you are having to discuss this kind of thing with somebody who doesn't share um, uh, a uh, separate lineage for humans and apes. I think that it's not completely fair to dismiss the argument from chromosome 2 because the fact that Darwinian evolutionists needed it to be there and it was found is a point. It's not a knockdown point for the other side, but it is a point. Conversely, however, I would say it's not completely f fair to dismiss the argument for short age from the Yellowstone Fossil Forest. We needed it to have been deposited rapidly. As it turns out, it is. We were able to take our our predictions and explore them scientifically and they turned out to be correct. And so it's a weak argument, but I think it's a valid argument that maybe there isn't as much time as is commonly assumed. If theory X requires A to be true, and theory Y could have either A or B to be true, doesn't matter then finding B to be true is a strong argument against X and a weak argument for Y. The reason I say it's a weak argument for Y is because now you have to consider theory Z and a few other theories that, that, that might also explain finding B. However, if theory X requires A to be true and theory Y could have either A or B to be true, then finding A is, it's not a knockdown argument, but it is a weak argument for X and a weaker argument against Y because Y never really made any predictions. That is to say, X has more predictive power. So I don't think that you can completely dismiss the argument about chromosome 2, assuming that it actually fits. 
On the other hand, I think that if you couple Luskin's arguments, which are uh, defensive in nature, with the powerful positive arguments of Axe, for example, um, I think that you start getting an, a, an argument that says um, that maybe uh, uh, something other than Darwinian evolution should be strongly considered, that uh, some kind of intelligent design may be part of uh, why we are here, in particular part of the difference between us and chimpanzees. And with that, I will open the floor to comments and questions. I was just thinking just a second ago. Do you think that intelligent design is a god of the gap that they predict will never be filled by science? Is that a kind of a a good definition without bringing God into it? No, it's a lousy definition. Okay. What's and, better? And let me explain to you why it's a lousy definition. Richard Dawkins starts his book the um, blind watchmaker by the state with the statement that biology is a study of complicated objects that give the appearance of being designed for a purpose i'm getting pretty close to the direct quote there um george wald i think it was was one of the noted people and i've forgotten which one it was talks about a telescope uh, and uh, he had mentioned a couple of other in inventions being something that was obviously designed for a purpose. He says that biological objects look like they're designed for a purpose as well. Um, Francis Crick says that biologists have to constantly remind themselves that what they are looking at is not designed, but evolved. Why? Because the appearance of design is hitting you in the face. <clears throat> now, you can go on to argue that that's a deceptive appearance. That happens in science occasionally. Um, but the argument that we're just doing a god of the gaps completely ignores the appearances. Well, that's exact. That's true. I I believe what you're saying there, but I don't think you're recognizing my limited scope of what I'm saying here. I'm saying people who are just completely physical in their nature. You talk to them, and you say, you know, they don't believe in spiritual things anyway. You go to them and you say, okay, this is a gap that will never be filled by science. That's, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to think about this, this guy last week who talked about the, the suit that somebody brought against a school saying that uh, intelligent design was talking about God. You know, they, they just didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep it within this limited structure of the physical. And, and in that limited structure of physical, they would say that there is a mystery here that the physical will never solve. And that's a, this gap. It will not, there won't be anything physical that will go into this gap. Well, I think that people who are, um, who are intelligent design advocates would be a little more careful, at least the, the better ones of them, would be a little more careful in saying that. What they would say is, this gap has not been filled. This gap gives all the appearance of never being filled. And while you can never say what the future holds for sure, <coughs> if you try to project it out to the best information that we have, we don't think it will ever be filled. 
And so it's not an absolute scientific argument. It is a, uh, like all scientific arguments, it's subject to being disproved. But it's, uh, but I think it's a good one. I mean, uh, we identify anything in our world by the fact that it produces effects that are not well explained by anything else. I can't get inside of you and you can't get inside of me to know that we are intelligent creatures that think and have thought processes. But you can observe my actions and you can infer from them that I'm an intelligent person that has thought processes that there's really something going on that I'm not some kind of complicated robot or, uh, or uh, that I'm different from, let's say, a chair or even a computer. And so we accept the reality of each other even though we can't really physically prove it because the evidence just seems much easier to explain if we take each other seriously as actual people. Mm -hmm. and, and so this argument for intelligent design is the same kind of argument. There are effects that if you put intelligence in there are quite easily explained. If you insist that there is no intelligence there, they are not explained well at all. <coughs> That's different from saying this is the God of the gaps. Well, I, I kind of think uh, what I understand the God of the gaps is, a, is, is more or less a fallacy because you will believe that no time, nowhere, it will be explained other than by God. Which, which is possible, you know, there's a lot of things that everybody, you know, in the past thought God did it, you know, and then after a while you explained how these things occurred, you know, with just, you know, Natural cause and chance. effects, effects mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's always possible with every gap. So it is. To, to say that, that a gap explains God is just a fallacy. That's that's all it's being said there, I think. Um, but we're talking in the realm of the physical and people who only believe in the physical here. I'm not talking about us who have an extant expanded reality of the spiritual. Um, well, I think I guess the, you can go even around the people that want to insist on the physical only are having increasing time, uh, trouble with uh, what they're doing. For one thing, if you ask about information, information is not strictly speaking physical. The number three does not exist in the same way that this uh, desk does, or whatever you want to call this thing, does or the chair, or my hand. It is a true an amount, though, but. It's, but it's an entirely different category from the physical. And yet the interesting thing of it is, the number three interacts with the physical. Mm -hmm. If you put two sheep in a pen and you put another sheep in a pen, you're gonna wind up with three sheep in the pen. If you have two coins in your wallet or your purse and you put another coin in your purse, you're gonna have three coins at the end. The number three happens to correlate with reality in a very interesting way. Reality is mathematically oriented and yet the number three is not a physical object. I think um, we need to keep in mind uh, to restrict your 
conclusions to the physical is not a basic logical principle. I don't think there's anything out there that tells us that uh, there's nothing beyond the physical. Uh, and I would say you look at the physical and you're almost forced to go beyond it. Well, you are forced to go beyond it in terms of mathematics. Well, yeah, I'm thinking in terms of the uh, precisions of the forces of physics, the design, uh, uh, arguments for life and so on. You know, that we've gone over those many times. <coughs> but uh, uh, I'd just like to complicate the picture a little bit because uh, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the uh, god of the gaps, uh, but there's another term that you can introduce that helps, I think, um, differentiate here, and that is the term the god of the necessary gaps. And the god of the gaps argument is, I, I mean, uh, it has been overused, I, 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 and it, it, uh, uh, but there. When you look at the physical world itself, you're kind of forced into, hey, the, the god of the necessary gaps. And then you can go to those arguments that so many, uh, uh, I think, thinkers uh, refer to in, in this, and that is that they go to the concepts of conscience, our feeling of existence. It's, uh, this is beyond what they feel the physical can explain, although some people try to explain it. Oh, wait, I don't get the idea that it doesn't enter our thinking. Uh, but the matter of consciousness and then the, the concept of right and wrong that we have, uh, altruism, uh, which uh, opposes, you know, evolutionary competition, uh, these are all things that uh, you know, make us think, hey, uh, don't bother me with just the physical world. Uh, that's too simplistic. Uh, my reality is beyond that. Or dictate that reality, by the way. What's that? Well, who will dictate that reality? Who dictates which? Who, who will dictate that reality that is beyond our comprehension? Uh, observation. The physical world forces me into that. I think there's a greater supremacy that allows us to have that revelation. Oh, sorry. I think there's a greater supremacy that allows us to have that revelation that will be concurrent and throughout all time and all distinctions. Uh, I didn't quite follow what you uh, were I just said, saying. But <laughs> there's always okay. going to be a supreme, more re a supreme greater reality always. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, I agree, I agree. Yes, Nick. Many years ago, when computers were much bigger than today, I remember that at UCR I was taking a course in computer, and uh, they had a huge building. That was the computer. This morning I look at this computer, show it. I mean, that building. <laughs> this little gadget is doing what that huge building was doing. And more. And more. And, more. and, uh, and I remember that uh, we had to babysit. We were using IBM cards, and I designed something, <coughs> and I fed the, the, the cards into the computer, and uh, it didn't come out right. So I... I was new at this business, so I decided to ask for help. And a student said, why don't you ask that blind man? I said, I thought to myself, blind man? A blind man would teach me? Well, I talked to this blind man. He said, read to me what kind of answer you got. And I read it to him. He says, this is what you, uh, this is where you made a mistake. He was blind, but he understood the complexities of something that has been designed. Now this reminds me 
of many years ago, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, Collins was here on this campus. And I have related this more than once. And he uh, was supposed to give the main speech, graduation speech. And he said, I was tempted to read to you the genome, human genome. But then I changed my mind when I figured out that it would take me 32 years of nonstop reading to do it. So, <laughs> now, after that, I read his book, The Language of God. And I was shocked when I found out that he, in spite of having used such a great argument for intelligent design, he decided to reject the idea that intelligent design is real. So you can see how a human being can be deceived. And I think the devil is into this deception. It's not humans. The devil himself is using uh, his arguments the way he used to deceive Adam and Eve. Am I wrong? Um. Yes, but it's more complex even than that. And, and let me explain this to you. Both in his book, and I heard him talk on the air once. Uh, it was being interviewed on a program. Um, he concedes that the design of the universe actually indicates a designer. Can you repeat? He concedes that the design of the universe actually indicates a designer. Uh, he also concedes that our sense of morality came from uh, uh, divine, divine uh, providence and that it does not come from uh, a blind uh, a Darwinian process because a Darwinian process would lead us to uh, behave in somewhat of a doggy dog fashion and the sensibilities of a morality um, are pretty close to universal. The people who don't have them are commonly considered psychopaths. Uh, and, uh, and yet they're antithetical to standard Darwinian theory. Darwinian theory should not have developed them. And those two arguments are actually design arguments. But he doesn't want to be put with the, the intelligent design community. The intelligent design community has gotten bad press <laughs> and furthermore has been hammered uh, socioeconomically. And there are a lot of people who don't like to be in that situation but who still recognize some of the basic arguments and they just, they're blind to the fact that in fact the uh, Collins arguments on the design of the universe are virtually word for word identical with those of intelligent design advocates. So there is some sociology going on here beyond just the fact that uh, Collins didn't want to be called intelligent design, or didn't want to take an intelligent design position. It's not just the scientific facts that we're dealing with, we're dealing with some sociology. Am I concluding then that Collins wanted to be popular and for that reason he decided to, you know, stick with uh, that uh, view? What is it? Um, I think it was John Upton that said, said it. Uh, it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when not understanding it is necessary to his livelihood. Okay. Uh, question? <laughs> yes. In one of the slides, uh, briefly you mentioned the vitamin C issue. I'm not clear as to what the evidence is for rejecting that 
argument that chimps and humans both share a common non-functioning vitamin C? That's a good question. The answer to it will take at least another half hour. <laughs> and the reason I know that is because the answer to it has been recorded on our website as one of the presentations that uh, I made here once. Um, if you go to the website and look down for, uh, it'll, be, it'll say vitamin C uh, as part of the title. Uh, and I remember it has, for part of the background, it has a lime, <laughs> which of course is. <laughs> sometimes things don't have correlation into the agreement, but there's an after note for everything, and there's something greater and greater and greater still. It, it, tur it turns out that uh, guinea pigs also have mutations in their vitamin C and their glucose. Um, as well as chimps and humans. And that uh, some of the exact same mutations are in the guinea pig line. It's a little bit difficult to imagine the same mutation going all the way from uh, the common ancestor of guinea pigs, humans, and chimps, and somehow bypassing mice, rats, uh, monkeys, whatever. So it looks like at least uh, some of the mutations, uh, the best guess that I can give is that it's a mutational hotspots and the mutations don't happen at random. Um, now of course if once you start saying that you start asking whether well maybe mutations don't happen at random and maybe uh, chimpanzees and humans actually share a common ancestor because um, uh, there's actually, if you want to call it that, either by God or by um, uh, some other force or perhaps by the way natural things are put together, that, that, there's, a, that there's a pathway, a common pathway that is easier to, to go down and that somehow guinea pigs and humans have followed that pathway and let's say mice have not, nor monkeys, nor cows, nor various other animals. Um, I'd rather be descended from a chimp than a pig. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, yes? I often read in the public media that intelligent designers are merely creationists in disguise which taints them somewhat. My good wife has purchased dozens of intelligent design books, and I try to read a few of them to keep up with her, and I find that most of them are scientists who have found fault with science as put out by the evolutionists, and they're merely trying to straighten things out in their area of expertise. I think that that's a good uh, observation. I will say that once you accept that there's an intelligent designer who could have intervened, it makes it much more difficult to do the kind of science that uh, people have been trying to do for historical science. And for example, when Dean Kenyon decided that evolution couldn't account for the first life, he did swing all the way from uh, uh, evolution to short age creationism. When John Sanford discovered that, that uh, the principle of genetic entropy, he swung all the way from being an evolutionist, a mechanistic evolutionist, to being a scientist believing in creation in a short age. So, uh, although they're not entirely accurate in that there are many people who believe in intelligent design who believe in long ages and even some who believe in common descent, Michael Behe being one of them, it is true that once you break 
that hold of materialism on you. There's no telling where you will wind up, and you may wind up being a creationist. Um, this is maybe tangential, but what you just said brings it back to what I was thinking. Um, we are to love God with all of our heart and mind, spirit, strength, strength being the physical, the other three getting more into the spiritual and intellectual and mental capacities of the brain. Interestingly, Jesus added the mind. And nobody objected. <laughs> Dr. Um, Harding, who used to be the dean of the School of Health here, um, said the function of stomach cells is to produce hydrochloric acid. The function of brain cells is to produce thought. And not only thought about intellectual things, but what we commonly called heart or spirit, um, our brain cells produce spiritual thoughts and loving thoughts. And these are thoughts that are just as real as the number three. <laughs> and they are not physical. They are not materializations of some satanic spiritualistic world that is within us and leaves the body at death. I don't believe that. Uh, but it is the function of our physical brain to produce thought that is capable of communion with God who is spirit. I guess I don't have much to add to that. I guess we have one here and one here and then we'll... He's giving up. <sighs> Go ahead. My comment does not have anything to do with today's discussion, but what I heard in the first service, maybe someone can help me. Uh, the preacher, Dr. Taylor, mentioned common era. About a year ago, I heard him say, before the common era, I've gone to Adventist schools 15 years. I've never heard this before. Maybe someone can help me here. It depends on how politically correct you want to be. And uh, uh, if I'm writing a paper, uh, that's going to be heard by people for whom that's an offensive term, I will sometimes leave it out. I'm much more concerned about the concept behind it than I am about the name. Uh, common Era versus uh, AD. I think it's kind of a picky thing for them to object mm -hmm. because uh, they should take the same attitude but some of them don't, and if you use those words, they won't listen to you. But you're speaking in an Adventist church. But if you're speaking in an Adventist church, why would, why would one use a common era? I'm, uh, I don't know, maybe they're afraid that there are some people out there who uh, are in the church who will be offended. Uh, I'm not sure that we should allow that to control so should all, we of our, the crowd? all of our comments. people's neutrality is, is a problem and the reason for that is because people don't like to dictate each other and like to afford each other but rather we need to be able to scrutinize it to a greater value each each and every time so it's not about the common area but being able to scrutinize people greater and greater still every time but and, uh, but then there leaves a the question though but in a, in a church setting I will use AD I don't have a problem with it uh, anyway well, I, I just wanted to make a comment or two about uh, when you give up being a pure materialist, uh, you are opening your horizon to all kinds of possibilities, as, as you referred to, uh, and so on. And it's <clears throat> you're not as secure. I mean, the, the physical is, you know, we're, we're comfortable with the at least I am, physical data. I, I love that stuff. It's solid and, and it's uh, undebatable, some of it, and so on. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, but when it, when it forces you out of that simplistic mode, uh, you need to keep in mind that, you know, uh, adopting the Bible, for instance, 
can be considered. Well, that's a subjective decision on your part type of thing. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, no, it isn't. Uh, at least it doesn't have to be. There are very good rational reasons for believing the Bible. Uh, one of the things I would say is that since my physical data says there's got to be some kind of designer, and since uh, part of that design seems to be uh, ability to think, uh, it'd be hard for me to think of a designer who would not communicate with us. <clears throat> and the Bible seems to be, you know, a reasonable. Uh, and it's probably the best candidate out there. Yeah. I, uh, but, and then, you know, there are other factors. Uh, Bible is historical authentication, there's prophetic uh, authentication, uh, and so on. Uh, so that uh, you're not giving up rationality when you give up naturalism or materialism or whatever term you want to use uh, for the physical world type of thing. Uh, and I, I, I insist that that physical world does tend to tell you that you've got to get out of it. You cannot explain yeah. many things unless you're willing to go beyond that limited outlook. No, in fact, if you try to demonstrate, uh, you can actually demonstrate that people who are absolutely dead set that material is the only thing that exists, you will find them continually avoiding difficult questions in fields such as quantum physics uh, to the point where they actually start denying certain important aspects of rationality. And it's very interesting to watch. It would take a lot longer than just, you know, two or three minutes to, to be able to show that, but it's, I've watched it happen. It's very interesting. The, yeah, the, the um, uh, thinking about the number three, you're, you're, you're uh, dealing with something that's non-physical and timeless. Uh, it's that kind of uh, tools, uh, that, that kind of property of mathematics is what allows uh, uh, cosmologists to look at other universes that we can't think of or, or we can't uh, experiment on. And the multiverse theory, for, for example, is a result of being able to build other universes based upon the mathematics that Assuming is not that tied mathematics to our holds in every universe? Yeah. Assuming, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it Which, of course, we have no way of telling. Yeah. Well, it, it, it holds for whatever is logically possible. And, uh, and, and so on that tool is there. I was just wondering now. Um, uh, in a discussion, is there a distinction? Uh, I mean, there's uh, in this in this chapter, it talks about you know, you've, you've talked about how um, intelligent design is supported, um, and but it, is there a distinguish? Is there any distinguishing information there that would separate theistic evolution from young universe or young earth, young life creationists? It, it really applies to both, doesn't it? It does apply to both, and in fact, uh, the 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 only place where it impinges on anything is it starts arguing that uh, perhaps uh, Behe's idea of common ancestry, but with intelligent design, may not be mandated by the facts. Uh, now, but that's the, that's trying to you know co uh, theistic evolution does not have to always adopt Darwinism? Uh, no, depending on the definition of theistic evolution. Yeah. There, is, there is what I would call kind of soft theistic evolution. And then there's the hard variety. And the hard variety says it looks just exactly like Darwin was right, except that there is a God anyway, and he set up the whole process. And you can't find his fingerprints anywhere. But that's not Darwinism because that's intelligence involved. That's Darwinism. not Darwinism, it's intelligence, but it's an intelligence that completely hides itself. Um, many atheists' reaction to that is, you got something that you couldn't tell it was there, why believe in it? And they have a certain amount of a point. Uh, that kind of theistic evolution is, is vulnerable to an attack by uh, 
by atheists that says your God is sort of like the ether. It's no longer needed. But that's, but that's uh, a discussion about what is the extent of the epistemic distance that God has set up between us and him. It is. And uh, so. But you see, what the, what the other intelligent design people will say is, um, God was involved. And you know what? If you look carefully enough, you will see that there are certain areas in which materialism just doesn't have an adequate explanation, but which makes sense on the basis of a God who was involved. And we've seen some of them uh, in some of the previous chapters. For example, uh, the argument that that one can only expect one undirected mutation at an absolute maximum with the most reasonable amount of improbability that you're looking at uh, in 140, uh, less than 140 million years. And yet humans are supposed to have arisen from chimpanzees. And there is no known Again, this is a scientific argument, so it's not an absolute argument. But there is no known pathway from chimps to humans that will allow you to get one mutation at a time. Each mutation keeps getting confirmed. Right. Anyway, so that's the other thing. Yes, Paul. I don't know how much more time we have, but we'll see. <laughs> Where, um, Go ahead, Nick. Okay. Yeah, the floor. We, we may agree that uh, using the expression common e era might be offensive to some people. Now, uh, this is different from uh, what uh, happened a few years ago, a friend of mine ask the Loma Linda University Church former pastor why he never preached about abortion. And he said, well, the, the, the answer is very simple. If I were to say anything about against abortion, some people would get offended. Well, tell this to John the Baptist, because if, if the life of 55 million human beings were lost, murdered, according to the Sixth Commandment. Uh, this is serious business. Now, what John the Baptist, uh, how do you say, objected, was uh, marrying uh, somebody else's wife. Nobody died as a result of marrying uh, Herod, marrying somebody else's wife. And yet John the Baptist put his head because this was sin and his duty was to preach against sin. That was the same about Jesus. He lost his life because he stuck to truth. And all his disciples paid with their lives for testifying to against sin. Now, modern preachers, Adventist preachers will not say anything against abortion. And uh, one person asked me, he says, uh, can you, do you, have you ever heard a sermon by an Advent pre uh, preacher against abortion? And I said, yes, I know only one. And I contacted that person, he sent me a, a CD. He did have the moral uh, courage to preach in a, an Adventist small church against abortion and nothing happened. He's still an Adventist preacher. He's still getting paid his salary. I mean, what happened to the Adventist church? How come we are silent? And not only that, but we are willing to spend all our energy into things like homosexuality or any other topic except abortion, because abortion would offend people. So let's stop preaching against sin, because preaching against sin offends people. What's your reaction? 
Well, actually, um, there are uh, there are a number of places where you don't, uh, or at least some people don't, uh, preach against homosexuality for the same reason. Um, now, whether those whether that's a good idea or not is a different question. You have two models in front of you, um, and. One of them is the model of John the Baptist, who said what he thought, and if it lo he lost his head, that was too bad. Um, the other is the model of the Apostle Paul, who became all things to all people, so that he might by all means save some. And he was stoned several times. Yeah, he was stoned several times, too. So that model doesn't really get you out, but there are a lot of people who look at that model and say, well, you know, in this case, what we really need is we need God's love, and so we don't need to preach about this or that or the other sin because what will happen is that nobody will listen to us. Um, there is a certain, there is a rationale for that in terms of what you tackle first. Um, on the other hand, if carried to extreme, it does prevent you from ever doing anything like the John the Baptist did or, um, as you point out, as Jesus did. Um, it's one area where I think that making the right decision calls for a great deal of proper understanding. Uh, of insight, of perception, whatever you want to call it, uh, perhaps more than most of us have. And um, I think this is one area where if you stay close to God, that His Spirit can guide you through some of these situations. But the problem is that there will come a certain resistance regardless of what happens to the point where you'll never say anything because it'll always be dangerous. Even if it's the right time, it can be dangerous. And so it's, um, I'm reluctant to judge somebody else on that kind of an issue. Um, but I think that uh, when the time comes, so God tells you that it's time to say something, that you need to mm -hmm. say it. Uh, and I think that abortion is one of the issues that uh, deserves more comment than it has gotten. I think that uh, I think that in certain areas, homosexuality has not been dealt with in the proper Christian way. I uh, know the leading leading Adventist was uh, worked for the church over 40 years, and he is against abortion. And I asked him, are you planning to do something about it? He said, yes, when I, re when I retire. He, he wrote to me the other day, he says, I retire now, I'm ready to speak. Well, um, it's always nice to be and I can get you to Is that the sound policy, is that the way Again, I have a hard time judging for others because they don't know their exact situation, including their understanding of their exact situation. Um, all I can say is that as for me in my house, um, we will serve the Lord to the best of our ability. Um, and I've already made my position fairly plain on it, I think. Uh, and I think that that's, that's important. And it's true for any of these situations. You know, there are some places where they don't say anything about the creation-evolution controversy because they're afraid they might offend somebody. And believe me, if they speak out, they will. Obviously, this class is not taking that stance. Um, 
I guess we have one or two more comments and we probably should wrap it up uh, after that. Go ahead. Yeah, and there's I, one uh, more here. Pass it over. Hello? Oh. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, I probably I think I mentioned this before, but uh, anyways, you know, every time this subject is brought up about people taking offense to uh, anything in the Bible, it's uh, it it seems very ridiculous to me because uh, people that are believers in the Bible and study it and understand, you know, its concepts or many of its concepts, uh, the whole world is an offense to to us, you know the way it's going, many things it's done, many things it's projecting on us all the time, 24-7 practically. And it's ridiculous. It's, it's like a bunch of whiners out there, you know. On the other hand, um, I kind of like that quote. It's, I'm sure you're familiar with it, where it says, uh, bad things happen in this world because good people say nothing. And... I believe Christians need to be more vocal and stop being such wimps, too. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you on that. There are a couple of uh, very unfair, unfair promises in the Bible. One of these is by the Lord himself. The other one is by St. Paul. Last year, about this time, I stood at the very spot where St. Paul was beheaded for his commitment to the Lord. And uh, those two promises, one of those, the Lord says, and you'll be hated by all men for my name's sake. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, which you don't hear it anymore from the pulpits of the Adventist Church. St. Paul says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If the Lord were to sing a song to us, I believe he'll sing, I beg your pardon. I never promised to Rose Garden. You see, talk, people talk about grace all the time. Oh, you're in grace. This is what St. Paul had to say. For grace that brings salvation has been revealed to us in these last days. That teaching, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly at this present place, age, age looking for the blessed hope to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who says that we are here to be pleasing people. That's so wrong. I mean, the Lord was crucified at the age of 33 for standing up for what, he knew, what was right. We are supposed to be blessings to the world. We are supposed to be blessings to the world. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. We're trying to move heaven down from above, down to earth. That's what we're trying to do. My religion isn't based on me being persecuted. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, but it's it shouldn't just be based on you not being persecuted either, and I think that's yeah, one of yeah. the points. I mean, you do what's right, you let the chips fall where they may, and sometimes you turn out like Joseph and are the second ruler in the kingdom, or Daniel and your third ruler in the kingdom. And sometimes you're going to turn out like the Isaiah who was sawed in half. And who knows which one it's going to be, what your job is to, is to be, do the right thing regardless. Amen. I would say, shouldn't, shouldn't trust a man that has no, no enemies. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> well, next week, come back, we'll finish the official part of the review, and then we'll get into unofficial reviews. <laughs>